Or do you think so? And if yes, why? If no, why not? So like when you're reading this story, uh, does it feel like uh, the same feeling as when you're reading about Odysseus wandering around uh, the area of Greek, of Greece? Question two. What do you think the story decrement says about life and death? Uh, in other words, if you could uh, try to explain the meaning of this story as related to life and death. Question three, how well do you think the story fragment describes the wanderings of Odysseus? Do, do you think that it accurately reflects uh, that story of Odysseus. Question four, in the story Last Islands, what do you think Odysseus is seeking? What is he looking for? And do you think that he finds it? Why or why not? Question five, how do you think these stories help turn the epic of the Odyssey into myth? Uh, like, what is, can you try to describe uh, the kind of transformation that happens between the epic and these stories? Uh, okay, so for this week, uh, question one will go to group five. Question two will go to group six. Is that right? One, two, three. No, no, no. Let's start over. Question one will go to group six. Question two will go to group one. Question three will go to group two. Question four will go to group three. Question five will go to group four. And uh, group five, you can also discuss question four. Uh, I'll give you around 10 minutes to discuss these questions. How does that sound? OK. OK, uh, so let's start with question one. The first story, one kindness. Uh, the question is asking, does it accurately reflect the mood of Odysseus's wanderings? If yes, why? If no, why not? So of course, we then have to establish what kind of mood this story has. So let's take a closer look. Odysseus clung to his raft of sticks as he was washed through the breakers and onto the shore of another island in the sequence of islands that filled his days. So immediately this first sentence establishes the uh, feelings that Odysseus has about his life during these wanderings. It's just another island in the series of islands that filled his day. So his life is just one island after another, one uh, unexpected adventure after another. So this sentence gives us the feeling that he's starting to uh, become numb to this kind of uh, fate for him. It's no longer as uh, exciting, it's no longer as full of hope. This is just his life now. But of course, if this island is nothing special, then there would be no story. So what is so special about this island? Uh, near the end of this first paragraph, uh, the last sentence, it occurred to him to walk in and throw himself on the mercy of the occupants. Uh, so if we think back to all of his adventures in the Odyssey, 
he never just walks in and hopes for the best, right? He always has some kind of plan. So here the story is telling us he thinks of giving up. He thinks there's no difference no matter where he ends up. He might as well see what happens. But instead he thought one more time and crept through the freezing rain-soaked night to listen. So he decides, ah, what the hell, well, I might as well um, use my brain to be careful one last time. It, the it, beginning paragraph is full of his despair and hopelessness uh, at ever being able to reach home. Paragraph two. Within the cave, three women sat around a snapping fire. The shadows on the wall behind them were the blurred silhouettes of sweet maiden, stout matron, and bent crone. So up to here, we realize that these three women are not just regular women. Uh, they represent the three stages of life for a woman, a sweet maiden, a young girl, or I guess young woman. A stoutly matron is kind of like a strong mother figure. And a bent crone is an old woman. So when we read up to here, right, three women surrounding a fire, one young, one middle aged, one old, our first thought is probably that these women are witches, maybe. Uh, and the story also encourages this idea because the sentence continues. But as the firelight flickered, the shadows took other forms. A long armed ogre with grasping hands, so that kind of a monster. A bird of prey with unfurled wings. A bird of prey is like an eagle. A net with glass floats. So like the shadows of these women also take on unusual shapes. Uh, which helps the idea that they're not just normal women, right? They may have some kind of special powers. Uh, and then Odysseus listens to them talking. Ten years is ten years, no matter how you cut it, which means no matter how you count the years, ten years is ten years. And uh, the idea of 10 years is a special idea when we talk about the Odyssey because we know that this is how long Odysseus wanders Greece. So even though Odysseus himself doesn't know when his travels will end, these women somehow do. Uh, so 10 years is 10 years no matter how you cut it, said one, brandishing a cooking knife. So she's holding a cooking knife. You can interpret all you like, but the facts are inescapable. Mere simple minded literalism, said another woman, using a ladle, Saudi, to stir a tarnished copper pot on a tripod all but swallowed by the flame. So it's not just fire, right? There's a ladle, there's a pot. It's sitting on three sticks of wood on top of the fire. Basically, these are just witches, right? These are three witches. And they seem to be discussing Odysseus's fate. One woman says, has to be 10 years, you know the rules. The other woman says, no, we can sort of interpret what 10 years really means. So apparently they're arguing about uh, how much they can interfere with Odysseus's fate. Uh, and so the second woman at the end of page one says tut, which is in Chinese is zhe zhe. There is some room to move within those chains, and I say he has suffered enough. Ah, so the reason the second woman wants to interpret 10 years more broadly is to help Odysseus and to prevent him from suffering more. And then the third woman starts talking. He has not begun to suffer, said the third. 
whom Odysseus now saw was the fairest and most terrible. Fair here means beautiful. So uh, Odysseus sees that this third woman is the most beautiful and the most terrible. Uh, now, at first, you might think these two ideas don't go together. But I'm sure you can think of someone or some kind of face that looks beautiful in a cold and cruel kind of way. So this third woman is that kind of woman. Uh, so they're arguing about how much to make Odysseus suffer or maybe help him from suffering more. Uh, then they talk about what's going to happen to him next. And what's going to happen is Odysseus will end up on the island of the witch Calypso. So this witch says, the witch Calypso in solitude on her island. Her bed is cold and she longs for him, though she does not yet know it. For all that she studies the stars and suspects that the sea will soon bring her a gift. For all means even though. For all that means even though. So uh, Odysseus's fate is to end up on the island of Calypso and to share her bed. Uh, one of the women says, and shall we make her a horror? So since Odysseus is fated to end up with Calypso, should we make Calypso a terrible woman, a horror, someone like ugly and cruel and evil? And at this moment, the hail crescendoed, which means it grew to its loudest point. And the fire was a red glow of embers. Odysseus gathered his courage thinking that after all the shadows might only be shadows, the women only women. So he's comforting himself. And in a high rough voice, so a voice that sounds like a witch said, no, let her be beautiful and as kind as summer. Such kindliness, sister, said one. Not from me, said another. Never mind, so be it, said the last. So Odysseus here manages to intervene in his own fate. He is the one who decides what Calypso looks like and how she will behave to him. But there's a twist at the end. But do not forget, said one woman, as the fire disappeared altogether, and the women merged into the shadows. So, uh, okay, let's continue first. He is, for all that he is bound by us, allowed just once to direct his fate. Though I, for one, shall not seek his counsel, uh, which means advice. Let us hope he does not meddle enough to get himself home. So only after Odysseus intervenes in his own fate does he learn that he actually is, is given one opportunity to intervene in his own fate. And after this opportunity has been taken and he has finished, the witches, the fire, the entire scene disappears. It seemed to exist only to give him that chance. And the final sentence uh, adds a kind of ironic twist to Odysseus also. Because, of course, if he himself knew that he could intervene, he wouldn't just ask for uh, an ugly witch to become a beautiful witch, right? He would probably ask to be sent home directly. But it is precisely because he does not know that he is given this opportunity that he cannot entirely save himself. So on the one hand, it looks like he's able to intervene. But on the other hand, the way that he intervenes is also limited by fate in that fate decides how he will discover this scene and these witches. So let's go back to the question.
Does this story accurately reflect the mood of Odysseus's wandering? Well, in the Odyssey, we don't really have a sense that Odysseus uh, is either entirely in control of his own fate or uh, that fate is entirely out of his control. It seems to be somewhere in the middle. So in that way, it's similar to this story, right? Odysseus in this story can intervene in his fate, but he can't decide how he will intervene. On the other hand, uh, in this story, he learns that he has this opportunity or rather that he had this opportunity. But in the Odyssey, we don't really seem to get an idea that he is struggling against fate. He always seems to be facing one challenge after another, uh, but he doesn't seem to think about like the overall picture, right? How will this uh, affect my journey to get home? Uh, would doing this, uh, affect the result? Would doing that affect the result? Uh, but it is true that the, what he does, or sometimes what his crew does, indeed has an effect on how long he has to wander, right? When he falls asleep uh, and his crew opens up the bag of wind, takes them away from home again, uh, Later in the story, in a part that we did not read in class, uh, when he warns his crew not to eat the cows of the sun god, and yet his crew eats them anyways, uh, it also sets them back, prevents them from getting home faster. Uh, and yet we know that uh, even though it seems to be that he's doing these things or he's not doing these things, uh, the overall length of his wandering is largely due to a curse by Poseidon, and Poseidon wants him to wander Greece for nine or ten years. But if we jump back to the first hand, uh, we also know that the Greeks didn't think of their gods as powerful alien creatures, right? The gods to the Greeks were uh, the idea of something in their life. So when they say that the sea god has cursed Odysseus to wander for 10 years, they're not thinking about a dude in the sea, right? They're thinking about the sea itself. Maybe the way that the sea flows, the connection with weather, uh, the life and control of the water. The water itself seems to be unfriendly and does not let Odysseus reach home uh, within 10 years. So if we think about both the story and the epic in terms of uh, only being partly in control of one's own fate, then yes, it does seem to be very similar, these two. But if we think about how aware Odysseus is of his uh, fate and his ability to change his fate, then it's quite different. The epic doesn't talk about this, whereas the story is entirely about this idea. That's what I think. Group one, uh, six, do you guys have ideas that you want to add? OK, let's move on then to question two. What do you think the story decrement says about life and death? Let's take a look at this one. This is a very short story. In the, la the lassitude after love, which means after they have just had sex uh, and they're kind of relaxing, Odysseus asks Circe, what is the way to the land of the dead? So this is, of course, based on something that happens in the epic, right? Circe tells Odysseus how to reach the land of the dead, how to go to Hades and meet Tiresias, these things. Uh, in this story, Odysseus asks Circe, 
And Cersei answers. You are muffled in folds of heavy fabric. You close your eyes against the rough cloth, and though you struggle to free yourself, you can barely move. With much thrashing and writhing, so you manage to throw off a layer, but find that not only is there another one behind it, but that the weight bearing you down has scarcely decreased. With dauntless spirit, you continue to struggle. By infinitesimal degrees, the load becomes lighter and your confinement less. At last, you push away a piece of coarse, heavy cloth and, relieved, feel that it was the last one. As it falls away, you realize you have been fighting through years. You open your eyes. So, first of all, what is the story like, act, like literally saying? Cersei is comparing life to being wrapped up in heavy fabric. And so when you have finished fighting your way out of this fabric, you are at the same time finished with life. And so when you open your eyes, you have reached the land of the dead. So the question is, what does this story tell us about the, the idea of life and death? It's comparing life to a coarse, rough cloth. So it's not like a comfortable blanket, right? It's it's uh, uncomfortable. It's rough against your skin. And it's heavy. It's oppressive. You want to fight your way out. You want to be able to move. So it seems to be describing life as a series of constrictions or a series of limitations. Uh, life in this definition would be uh, the thing that prevents you, the thing that keeps you bounded uh, or binded. And so the struggle against these restrictions is portrayed as brave and courageous. And little by little, you get to throw off layers of the cloth in other words, you throw off years of your life. And when you finally break through the, the last layer of cloth, uh, at the same time, you have broken through the last year of your life. And so when you open your eyes, you are no longer alive. You must be in the land of the dead. And in that case, death seems to be uh, described as a kind of freedom. There's no longer anything uh, bearing you down, there's nothing heavy on you, there's nothing limiting you. All you have to do is to open your eyes and you're there. This is kind of the opposite of how we usually think of life and death, right? We think of life as full of hope and potential and death unless you believe in a religion, but if you don't believe in a religion, death is usually just the end. There's nothing. Uh, so in many ways, this story is quite Greek. If we remember the idea that the Greeks have of the underworld, of those who have died, uh, when Odysseus goes to visit them in Hades, they have no memories, they cannot communicate unless they drink the blood and mixture that Odysseus has prepared. So if they don't have a source of life energy, they cannot communicate, they cannot um, express life to each other either. Uh, and so if we think about it this way, all of the things that are connected to life, energy, memory, experience, we value them, they're very important, but we also don't have a choice. We can't be alive and choose not to have memories or not to have experiences. 
we can't be alive and refuse to move or do things or think things. And so uh, this story seems to be treating all of the attributes, the positive traits of life as limiting. We are forced to accept them. And so we can also say something about the setting of this story. It takes place right after the passion of sex is starting to fade. Sex, of course, is symbolic of life. It creates life. It's one of it's seen to be one of the most uh, joyful parts of living experience. And it's after this symbol of life, after they are coming down from a high, that Circe presents this opposite view of life. But it, it's not entirely Circe who comes up with this idea. What normal person would ask, how do you reach the land of the dead? By asking this question, Odysseus shows that he himself has some kind of desire to reach the land of the dead. This is not something that people who love life and value life would usually ask. And so we can also say that Circe's answer reflects Odysseus's heart. That desire buried deep inside him is given proof by the answer that Circe gives. Now in the Odyssey, we know that Odysseus doesn't want to go to the land of the dead, uh, but Circe tells him he has to. But in this story, it is Odysseus who actively wants to, to learn how to reach Hades. And so the answer that Circe gives seems quite fitting to the kind of character that Odysseus is in this story. Uh, group one, do you want to add ideas about question two? Okay, let's move on to question three. How well do you think the story fragment describes the wanderings of Odysseus? This is also a very short story. A single fragment is all that survives of the 45th book of the Odyssey. Now, hang on. The Odyssey we have only has 24 books. So why would this one have 45? Uh, well, we should remember two things about the Odyssey that we have. First, that it is the result of someone, possibly Homer, collecting stories from various different parts of Greece that have been passed down from generation to generation and using some way to put these different stories together and to make them make sense. So it's possible that he left out a lot of material when composing his version of the Odyssey. In fact, it's possible that he left out more material than he kept. If the different traditions of the Odyssey didn't fit together, he may have cut out a lot of other stuff. The second idea to remember is that we are reading this story from more than 2000 years away. And for most of those 2000 years, we couldn't simply upload it to Dropbox. Things got lost. The Library of Alexandria was burned. Uh, in the 15th century, the monasteries of England were destroyed and all of their books were lost. So it's also possible that other traditions of the Odyssey did exist, but were lost through the years. And in fact, we know that, uh, for example, the Iliad is only one part of the story. It's only one section of a much longer story. Uh, and historians have discovered um, versions of the Trojan War that are told from the Trojan side. 
whereas the Iliad is told from the Greek side. So the idea of a 45th book of the Odyssey uh, also ties this story into the tradition of classic literature that has been passed down and also that has been lost in history. And so of this 45th book, the story says we only have a single fragment. Odysseus, finding that his reputation for trickery preceded him, started inventing histories for himself and disseminating them wherever he went. So in other words, Odysseus became so famous for trickery that in order to prevent others from being careful around him, he started inventing false histories for himself and spreading them among people so that people weren't really sure of what kind of person he is. This had the intended effect of clouding perception and distorting expectation, making it easier for him to work as he was wont, which means as he wanted to. And the unexpected effect that one of his lies became with minor variations, the Odyssey of Homer. So the story is saying that the, the Odyssey that we have isn't exactly what happened. It's one of the lies that Odysseus told throughout his life. So the question is, how well do you think this describes the wanderings of Odysseus? Do they seem like he's lying? Uh, now, on the face of it, yeah, it kind of does, right? Like, uh, he tells tales about, like, one-eyed giants, like, uh, going to the land of the dead, witches who turn his men into pigs. I mean, like, who would believe that, right? But we should also remember that in the story, this is stuff that Odysseus is telling to his host, the Phaeacians. So the story itself seems to be telling us to be careful not to believe everything Odysseus tells us. And so it seems like the story itself is truthful in that it presents Odysseus as a liar. So if Odysseus spread the Odyssey as one of his lies, it is a very good lie because it is a lie that makes us think that the teller of the Odyssey is truthful precisely because the Odysseus in the Odyssey is a liar. Because remember, right, when Odysseus is telling his story, all of his crew have died. He is the only survivor. There are no witnesses. And of course, there's no proof. His ship, all of his ships have been lost. So whether he's lying or telling the truth, nobody knows. And Odysseus himself is smart, so he knows that nobody can prove that he's lying. So he uses that opportunity to create a kind of story for himself. Now, if I were Odysseus, I'm probably not as smart, but if I were Odysseus, I would not lie from beginning to end. I would add some parts that maybe feel real or that maybe connect with something that my hosts already know. Uh, maybe I might talk about places that they have heard of. I might talk about legends that they have heard of. Uh, so we can say that the better designed Odysseus's story is in the poem, the more carefully crafted or the more doubt that the poem itself wants us to hold towards Odysseus. And if the poem wants us to doubt him, should we also doubt the poem? If uh, the entire poem is, as the story says, one big lie from Odysseus, he is going to be one of the best liars in all of history. 
But in thinking about this question, I think it's less important to figure out what's true and what's not. And more important to notice how Odysseus and the poem plays with the truth. How the truth is not the highest standard, but rather is just one more thing that Odysseus and that the poem can use to keep us guessing, to entertain us over thousands of years. Group two, do you have other ideas that you want to add to this question? It's also interesting when we're talking about truth and lying that the short story purports to be a fragment of a much longer work. It's saying that this is the only part of the complete odyssey that has survived. And we all know the danger of only looking at a small part of a bigger picture. Perhaps this part is also a lie. Let's move on to question four. In the story, Last Islands, what do you think Odysseus is seeking? And do you think he finds it? Last Islands is the longest story. I could not think of myself as old. So, okay, we have an I. Right, the someone is telling us this story. I could not think of myself as old, but my world had become a traveler's tale. I thought I should be happy with wealth and lands, sun and fame, but I was not. For all that, a constant stream of visitors came from far away and thought it a privilege to sit at my table and hear my stories. Though I was approaching my 70th year, I went to the gymnasium daily so that my guest would not wait till I had left and then say, can this be the man who was Odysseus? So we learn that it is Odysseus who is telling us this story. Uh, let's jump to the next paragraph. Paragraph two on the next page. One day, I realized that I had told the stories of the Cyclops, the Sirens, and the duel with Ajax. Uh, the duel with Ajax is not actually part of the Odyssey. It's a, another part of the tradition that we didn't read in class. It's not in the Iliad either. Uh, it's in one of the plays written by ancient Greek playwrights. Uh, one day I realized I had told these stories so many times that I no longer remembered the actual events so much as their retellings and the retellings retellings, which through a gradual accretion of spurious detail and embellishment had, for all I knew, diverged drastically from the truth. So each time he tells these stories, he adds something to make it a little more exciting, to make it a little different. And over time, he himself has forgotten what is the true version of these stories. Had I really been so beautifully poised while the Cyclops glutted my, himself on my sailors, drawing my sword to kill the beast, but checking myself when I realized that victory would mean imprisonment? So this is the story of the Cyclops. Sometimes in dreams, my sword arm went nerveless at the sight of the giant rending and devouring my men, and I dropped my blade and scurried behind the monster's cheeses. So he's worrying about what is the truth so much that sometimes when he's at night asleep dreaming, he dreams that maybe the truth is he was a coward and that he did not uh, lead and save his men. I exhumed my old bronze bow from the back of a storeroom. Bow is, uh, 弓, 弓箭的弓. In the torchlight, it flickered back and forth between a death-dealing heirloom that had sent countless warriors to hell 
and a quotidian implement to hang beside the rakes in a yeoman's cottage. So when he looks at it, sometimes he thinks of it as a deadly weapon. Sometimes he thinks of it as something to put on his wall for decoration. Uh, let's skip uh, to the next paragraph. I often wondered what had happened to Pallas Athena, the goddess. Her absence grieved me, and I was no longer sure I had not imagined her. It is unlikely she was an illusion, I told myself. Most of the details of my travels have become vague, but I will never forget the clarity of mind she brought me, like a lucid, sunlit dream. Probably because Athena is clarity of mind. When someone in ancient Greece said that Athena came to them, what they mean is my mind was suddenly clear. So here is Odysseus in his old age at home, peaceful, wealthy, the king of his island. But he's starting to doubt himself. He's starting to doubt his history and his value. One night as I sat by the fire with Penelope, his wife, I told her I was going on a trip to the east, possibly raiding, more likely visiting old friends. Why would he do that? What is he looking for? Let's take a 10 minute break and we'll continue after that. Before we continue, let's talk about the final exam. The final exam will look a lot like the midterm exam, but there will be three questions and you only have to do one. The first question will ask you about what is a myth? How can you tell? The second question will ask you about fate and free will in Oedipus Tyrannos. And the third question will ask you about the similarities and differences of God in the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible. So now you know what I'm going to ask you. Uh, next week, please finish reading this handout. I will pass out the next handout. Uh, I finally managed to get a copy of the new translation of Oedipus Tyrannos, so we can all read the slightly easier version. It also comes with many more footnotes. Uh, so if you're confused about something, maybe it will help a bit more. So next week I will pass out that handout and uh, introduce the next unit. OK, let's come back to this. So we now have a picture of Odysseus in his old age. And now he says to his wife that he wants to go east again. I saw her formulate an objection, line two. She, uh, she would miss me and believed I was more comfortable with her around. Conceal it because she didn't want to be a shrew and thought she'd have a better chance of getting her way indirectly. Put on an expression of mild inquiry, so kind of mildly curious to avoid revealing her indirect intentions with a conspicuous blankness, and finally see in my face that I had followed her chain of thought, which made her smile. So this is a very interesting sentence. At the end of the Odyssey, when Odysseus tells Penelope that he is her husband, she doesn't believe him. He's been gone for 20 years. Uh, it's normal for someone to doubt a strange man who walks in, kills all the men in the house, and says, I am your husband. So to prove it, he tells her a secret that only they know. And the secret is that their bed cannot be moved because it is built into a living olive tree, a tree that grows through their bedroom, and he cut out their bed from this tree. 
and it's something that only he and she know. So this tells us that they have a kind of uh, chemistry, a kind of unspoken agreement, your mochi. And that is demonstrated here in this sentence. He follows her face and can tell exactly what she's thinking. And she discovers that he knows what she's thinking. And so at the very end, she simply says, she told me not to be gone long. Any kind of objection that she might want to raise has already been discovered by her husband. And so she knows that it would be no use. It's a very intimate kind of uh, wordless communication. Uh, she told me not to be gone long. I said I would try, and I hope that this time the house would not be full of strange men when I came back. She promised to do her best, but could not help the power of her beauty. So not only do they have an unspoken understanding, they also are able to lightly joke with each other. I sought out my old companions in their gardens and estates. OK, so this part also does not fit with the story of the Odyssey. In the Odyssey, by the end, Odysseus is alone, right? All of his men have already died. But here, he still seems to have some companions. So he goes to find his old companions, old friends, and told them what was in the offing, so what he was going to do. Most of them had died, and of the living, most were infirm, which means injured or disabled. But three of the halest, which means healthiest, laughed when they heard my plan and said they would like nothing better than to sail with their old captain one more time. They brought out swords that had not been drawn in 20 years and came to port to oversee the lading of the ship. Next paragraph. It was only as we sailed out of Ithaca Harbor that I told them we would retrace my long trip home. So he's not just going to visit friends, he's recreating his 10 year journey. Our first port of call was Phaeacia. This is where he was telling his story, which we reached in five days of peaceful sailing. Already we have a difference from the epic. In the Odyssey, no matter where Odysseus goes, it's always through struggle and bad weather and the anger of the gods. But here he reaches Phaeacia in five days of peaceful sailing. We entered the empty harbor at noon. The quiet was profound. Profound here means deep. It was very quiet. And we were unsurprised to see the city abandoned. Young trees grew from cracks in the city wall and the rotting remnants of a pier swam below the water's surface. Uh, and then at the end, they sailed away. So what the first part of our discussion question, what is he seeking? What does he want? He gathers his old men. He goes to retrace his journey. And we know that his life at the moment is kind of boring and unsure. So it seems like what he wants is to rekindle the excitement of his younger days. Compared to the peace and wealth that he has now, it's all kind of boring and monotonous and bland. It seems like he wants to relive the high points of his life. But the first stop he reaches is empty. Not only is it different, there is nobody there. Next was Ogygia, Calypso's island, which seemed to have gotten smaller. This is also an interesting detail. It has, seems to have gotten smaller. 
Uh, in the Odyssey, this part we also didn't read, but Odysseus spent like eight, nine years on this island. Uh, Poseidon was punishing him by not giving him wind, and so he could not sail away from the island. So he spent so many years here, and yet when he comes back, it seems smaller. Uh, I say it's interesting because this is also something we say when we return to our childhood home, or like we go back to our elementary school. Everything seems smaller. And of course, that's because when we were there the first time, we were little kids, so everything looked very big. So saying that something seems smaller is a sign uh, that you have changed throughout life, that you are looking at the same events and same places from an older point of view. Uh, so here he goes up to look for Calypso's cave and finds nothing. Just like in the town of Phaeacia, there is nothing here. Last line, I wondered where she had gone, but did not know where to look. In a way, the entire journey in this story is he doesn't know where to look. Next was Ayaya, Circe's isle, uh, which had been a thicket then and was a thicket now. Wolf song hung in the evening air, and the young men's eyes shone as they hefted their spears. Okay, this looks more promising. The natural environment is the same. You still hear the sound of animals, wild animals. And so uh, his men, he describes them as young men, although they're, they're uh, also very old. Uh, the idea is his men seem to grow younger because they're excited and they pick up their weapons and they're ready to meet the challenge. There were signs of recent visitors, old campfires by the anchorage. Anchorage is where they put the ships. Piles of smashed pottery, litter in the bushes. I hiked up the hill to Circe's house in the failing light, my men behind with weapons ready. The walls of her house had burned away leaving only charred beams, flagstones, and the fireplace. So it's slightly better than the previous two stops. At least there's proof that somebody or something was here. But again, it's basically disappeared. The house was burned away. Cersei is gone. Only animals remained. And soon we left. Next was the island of the Cyclops. Uh, let's, let's jump to the middle of this paragraph. As we crept up the shingle toward the wood, toward the forest, I felt some of the old life come back, and I nearly put an arrow into a boy who came running out of the trees. So Odysseus here is also starting to get that younger energy. But instead of meeting a cyclops, he meets a young boy. Uh, and he, in the, at the bottom of this paragraph, he lived in a house over the next hill with his dog, parents, and a sister. So instead of a land of large, one-eyed monsters living alone, Odysseus discovers a young boy living with his family. He knew little about the Cyclops. They had been gone when the first colonists arrived, except for an old blind one who lived alone in his miserable cave and died of unhappiness soon after men came. So this seems to be saying that the story was real, right? That they had an old Cyclops who was blinded, and we know that Odysseus stuck his spear through the eye of the Cyclops. Uh, so it seems like maybe his story was true, but there's no proof anymore. And when Odysseus mentions to the boy his own story at the end of this paragraph, uh, oh, sorry, and when the boy asks Odysseus about the old legend, Odysseus resorts to his old habits and he lies. He says, I admitted that I had heard of that Ithacan, 
but did not believe a word of his story. Uh, and then they go to visit the bones of the old Cyclops. Uh, and it says the skull had a single wide orbit flanked by fearsome tusks nearly half as long as its body. So the head bone had a hole in the middle and on two sides had long tusks. And the story gives us a footnote at the bottom of this page. This is a very interesting footnote. In prehistoric times, the Greek islands were home to a number of species of small mastodons. A mastodon is uh, like a furry elephant. Uh, Although they did not long survive the arrival of man, they did leave a fossil record. And interestingly, their skulls, like the skulls of all pachyderms, have a monoorbital cyclopean appearance. So here the story is telling us maybe the bones that Odysseus has found do not belong to a cyclops, maybe they belong to a woolly mammoth. So again, no proof. Uh, last line of this paragraph, we went back to the ship and sailed for Troy. We came within sight of that city in the hour just before sunset when the light falls in warm sheets and makes every face beautiful and every banality poignant. So it's the sunset hour. Everything is beautiful and romantic. The city walls were higher even than in memory. So this is the opposite of the island of Calypso. There everything seems smaller. Here the city walls seem higher. With grim silhouettes patrolling and watch fires ablaze on every tower. As the ship coasted into harbor, I had the sudden conviction that my time had come again, that all the ghosts of Troy had come up from hell to guard their haunted city. So he prepares to land. He meets the Trojans on the shore. Uh, last line, the Trojans gave a shout and one of them threw something. I jumped to the side and raised my shield. It took me a moment to realize that the bombardment was not of stones or arrows, but the petals of myriad red flowers. So the Trojans aren't attacking him, they're throwing flowers at him. As I lowered my shield, the petals clinging to my armor like splattered bud, uh, blood, the cries I had taken for defiance resolved into a chorus of welcome. So the Trojans aren't shouting at him, they're shouting for him. As the ship came into harbor, I saw the cheerful crowds on the quay and heard the distant singing. Uh, let's look at the second line of this paragraph. Ashore, vendors sold trinkets and meat cooked on sticks. Children shrieked and parents bought them sweets. So Troy is no longer a fearsome city. Troy is now like a big market, like a fair. People selling small toys and food and candy. Uh, let's jump to the middle of this paragraph. I winced after the break. I winced to see a marionette Ajax slaughtering Denira on a plywood altar amid a welter of fluttering red rags. This is a puppet show. So it's taking an old Greek legend and retelling it as a performance for children. And it, the story tells us that his younger crew members, apparently he gathered some uh, people who, younger people who worshipped his legend, uh, were very entertained. But even my old companions, three lines from the bottom, my old companions took themselves off the ship more gingerly, but were pleased to have a stroll in the city that had been the focus of so many years ambition, but which they had never really seen. 
always having been besieging it or burning it or sailing away. Which is kind of true, right? The Greeks were so busy fighting Troy, they never really appreciated Troy. So Odysseus walks through, he notices people selling tourist uh, attractions and tours of famous places throughout the city. He notices many actors and performances of the ancient tales and of the Trojan War. This is not what he had imagined, right? He wanted ex excitement, adventure. Instead, he has found his own story turned into entertainment for children. As the sun set, I pushed my way through the crowds and out the gates, walking up into the hills from which I could see the city and all its precincts. Chu. That was where Agamemnon had his camp, I thought, and that is where Achilles had his funeral games. So he can see the whole city and the areas around the city. And so he's telling, he's saying to himself, oh, this is where that happened. This is where that happened. Last line. I said to myself, somewhere I must have made a mistake. Turn down the wrong street. Open the wrong door. Failed to make a sacrifice when the God was willing. And now I am old and not far from nothing, and everything I knew has turned to smoke. So at this point in his journey, it makes him feel even more hopeless. Every time he tries to find proof of his story, uh, there's nothing there, only legends and plays for children. Who knew, who knows what's real or not? Something glinted golden in the dust at my feet. I stooped to dig it out and found a disc of metal, a shield. Amazed, I saw that it was made of gold. Not only that, but it was the very shield forged for Achilles by the divine smith Hephaestus, which, had won at, uh, which I had won at Achilles' funeral games and lost again on the disastrous trip home. The shield of Achilles. We didn't read this part of the Iliad, but it was part of the handout if you were curious enough to read the parts that you did not have to. The shield of Achilles is so unique and special that an entire book of the Iliad, one whole chapter, was devoted to describing it. It's impossibly big. It's impossibly strong. It's so big that there are three circles, uh, three concentric circles, one bigger than the other on the shield. And within each circle is a painting of a society, a painting of life, of farmers, of cities and towns, of people going about their lives, getting married, burying their old people. It's a it's one of the most famous pieces of weaponry in all of Western literature. And here Odysseus finds it on the shores of, uh, on a hill outside of Troy. It was almost too heavy to lift, but I hefted it with both hands and study its familiar surface. I wondered how it could have come back to Troy Next paragraph. I could not bear the thought of bringing it back to Ithaca to gather dust on my wall. So in the fading light, I walked down to the beach where all our ships had landed so many decades ago, and in a sudden access of strength, threw it toward the sea. For a moment, it seemed to hang motionless in the air, and I wondered if my gesture had somehow permitted me to step out of time. But then the shield splashed heavily into the water, and the waves closed over it, and I went back to my ship with a light heart. So the question is asking, what is Odysseus seeking, and did he find it? 
it seems like he's seeking either excitement or some kind of proof that he really did what they say he did. He really did what he says he did. That the legends are not entirely false. He That he deserves his fame. And does he find this proof? Well, the story says that he left with a light heart. So apparently he feels like he has found proof. If the shield of Achilles is real, then all of the rest must also be real. But that's not the end of the story. We get a section break. Among the dunes stood Athena, who still watched over him as best she was able. So this is some this part is something that Odysseus does not know. This is just for the reader. And the first thing the reader learns is that Athena is real and that she really does favor Odysseus and take care of him more than the other humans. She was relieved to see him sail back toward Ithaca, where she knew a peaceful death would find him before the year was out. So he would die peacefully within a year. Like him, the goddess had a light heart. She was grateful that his eyes were not as sharp as they had been and that the light had been flattering, which means it made things look good, but not too bright. And he had not noticed that the workmanship of the shield was crude, the figures awkward, that there had been countless other shields just like it for sale, cheap among the stalls in Troy's ruins. So the shield that Odysseus thinks is the shield of Achilles turns out to be just another toy. And yet, Odysseus doesn't know this. So does he find what he's looking for? I think yes, even though it is not what he thinks it is. Maybe he's not looking for proof itself, right? He didn't take the shield and bring it back with him home. Maybe he's looking for some kind of confirmation, some kind of spiritual affirmation, some guarantee from the world that he is not living a lie, that his life did have purpose, that he did do something important and lasting, and that the stories that are told of him are actually about him. And he feels like he found what he's looking for even though the shield isn't real. But the, the end of the story isn't just about the shield. We also meet Athena. The world of this story seems to be very realistic. We don't see any monsters. We don't see any other gods. Even when we do see a skeleton of the, cy of the Cyclops, there seems to be another scientific explanation for that uh, skeleton. It's only after we leave the perspective of Odysseus that we meet Athena. And so if Athena exists in this world, who's to say that Odysseus got his story wrong? If he remembers Athena and Athena exists, then maybe everything else that he remembers is true also. So he discovers a shield he thinks is real. Uh, he is relieved and grateful. He has found what he wants. But the shield is not real. But the person who tells us that the shield is not real should not be real either, except she is real, Athena. So in a way, we can say that Odysseus finds what he's looking for, but he finds it in a different way from how he wanted to find it. Group four, do you want to add ideas to this question? 
OK. Question five, how do you think these stories help turn the epic into myth? So we're now discussing what is a myth. Well, if we think about the last story, right? Last Islands. This seems to be asking this precise question. Is this story more history or more myth? Epic we can think of as a kind of history. History was invented after epic poetry. Uh, the first historian was a Greek person named Herodotus, Shilodota, and he lived, uh, I would say, hundreds or maybe even a thousand years after the Trojan War. So before history, there was epic poetry. So we can think of it as more like the truth. So last islands, this story seems to be uh, thinking about the question, how does history turn into myth? When Odysseus was living through his adventures, they were, of course, history. They were real to him. They were real to his crew. But after so many years at home, after telling the story again and again, he is no longer entirely sure that his stories are real. He, the stories have slowly moved from history towards something less certain. They're not complete lies, because when he goes to visit the Cyclops cave, the young boy says that he has heard of this story. So it's not like Odysseus made up these stories after he got home. So there is still some connection to the original history. But the connection is no longer certain. It's no longer sure. There is always now room for doubt. Were the people who lived at this abandoned city named Phaeacia really the people who helped Odysseus home? This empty cave, did Calypso really used to live here? Did this burned house really used to be the house of Circe? And are these wild animals her pets that used to be humans? Is this Cyclops skeleton really just a very hairy elephant? And all of the people at Troy who are treating it as a tourist destination and putting on performances and selling trinkets and mem uh, memorabilia. Is there a connection between what they sell and what really happened? Or are they simply making money from a story? And there is no connection with the history. And in many ways, that is what a myth is. It's a story that could be true but also doesn't seem like it would be true. And yet, for some reason, people still treat it as if it might be true. It's not like a novel, Xiaoshuo, right, which we all know is not true, or even if it is based on something that really happened, the author has changed things around, and you're supposed to think that it's not real. A myth is kind of the opposite. It's full of details and stories that seem impossible, that seem supernatural. And yet somewhere inside, you will always have a part of you that thinks, maybe it really did happen like this, or maybe what happened, uh, maybe the people who experienced this really did think that this is what happened. That's also a kind of truth. Truth doesn't have to be scientific and objective. Truth can be based on experience. At the end of Last Islands, Odysseus believes that he has found proof that his life has meaning. The proof is false, but the result is true. He still does believe what he believes because he mistook the toy for a real shield. 
we can think a bit more about this question next week when we're going to read some actual myths. Um, next week we're reading a collection of or we're going to read two or three or maybe four stories from a collection of ancient myths. And just like the stories in Last Islands, the myths that Ovid tells are far in the past. He is also a collector of stories. He doesn't invent them. He learns about them, he organizes them, and he puts them, he strings them together into a structure that connects one story to the next story. And we can think about whether a myth really happened or not, but we can also think about why these stories have survived. Uh, they existed before Ovid wrote them down, and after he wrote them down, they kept on being passed down to the present day. So much of ancient literature and history and philosophy has been lost. That what we do still have is incredibly important because it shows that it is important enough in the past for people to try their best to preserve it. If your library is burning, what kind of books do you save first? The most important ones. Those are the books that we have today. So we can also think about why these myths are so important for the people of the past. Even if they don't believe that these stories are true, they must have some kind of importance or meaning for them. So that even today we're still talking about them in Taiwan in 2022. And in many ways, the importance of these myths exists not on the level of story, but on the level of symbolism, Xiangzhen. I hope you remember when we discussed this last year, uh, because we're going to think about the symbolism of these myths and stories next week. So I didn't choose too many myths for you to read. Um, and the myths that we are going to read are mostly pretty famous. Let's see, Ovid. Uh, following classic tradition, the Metamorphoses, this book of poems, uh, it's written as poetry. And there are, again, 24 books, or the Sidrin. But unlike the epic poems, these poems are not meant to be read all the way through. Like they don't combine to make one single coherent story. It's more like an excuse to tell different myths. So from one story to the next, maybe you have the same storyteller. Maybe one of the characters becomes the teller of the next myth. Maybe one person starts telling a whole group of myths that are related in theme or have some other kind of similarity. So it, like, it doesn't really matter whether you understand the entire metamorphoses. The important thing is to think about the individual myths. Now, our textbook has very kindly added the common name for each myth. In the original book, of course, it's just book one, book two, book three. Uh, but because the individual myths are more important than the overall story, so over the years, people have given names to these myths. And so these are the names that the textbook gives us. Unfortunately, it doesn't separate the myths very cleanly. Sometimes under one name, we will find two myths, maybe even three myths. So as you read, please read, but as you read, um, pay close attention to where one myth ends and the next myth begins. Because sometimes you will have no warning. You will, uh, 
read into a new stanza and suddenly discover that you're in another story. And that fits with the theme, right? Metamorphoses, xing. Not only do some characters change, but also the story changes as you read. OK, so this week, do you have questions? OK, so before next week, please finish this handout and next week I will pass out a new one. Yes.